think it's, well, it's the 60s. It's race. A drug deal gone bad, okay? Result of drugs. Somebody evidently didn't pay their drug bill. That's what the thought. Well, drugs were found at the Tate residence by investigators, and they were linked to Frykowski and Folger. And so because of that, they first thought this was kind of a drug deal gone bad, okay? Um, Polanski, when interviewed, adamantly denied that the murders were drug-related. He stated his wife never took drugs, and especially would not take drugs during her pre pregnancy, which I think he was telling the truth, okay? The next day, on August 10th, 10 miles away from the Tate murders, two other people were murdered. Leo LaBianca and his wife Rosemary were brutally murdered in kind of the same fashion. He was a grocery executive. He owned grocery, not stores, but places that would send groceries to stores. Very wealthy man. He was a respectable businessman. He had a wholesale grocery company. Um, he was very well liked. He did not have a lot of apparent enemies that would do something. Friends described him as a very quiet, conservative, very nice person. Mrs. LaBianca was younger than him, very attractive, 38-year-old Hispanic woman. She met her husband in the 40s. The couple had two children that had grown and gone. The LaBiancas were stabbed a total of 67 times. Mrs. LaBianca, 41 times. Lino LaBianca, 26 times. The scene surrounding Mr. LaBianca was gruesome. He was found in his pajamas, lying with a pillow cover over his head, a cord from a, uh, a, lamp, a lamp was wrapped around his neck, his hands were tied behind him, a carving fork, you know, that you use like at Thanksgiving time to carve the turkey, was protruded from his stomach, the word war had been carved in his flesh, and a knife was lodged in his neck. Rosemary LaBianca was lying on the floor, her nightgown up over her head with a pillowcase over her head, and a lamp cord tied, tied around her neck as well. In the living room wall, written in blood, were the words, Death to Pigs and Rise, R-I-S-E. And then on the refrigerator door, the words, Helter Skelter, which actually was spelt incorrectly, by the way, were smeared in blood as well. Now, these two murders, back-to-back -back nights in such brutal fashion, were so stressful because they were both in the Hollywood area of Beverly Hills, that over 200 handguns from one gun shop were sold the, the next day after the second murder. And a person couldn't get a locksmith to change the locks in their house for over two weeks because people panicked. I mean, these were just brutal, brutal murders. Well, because the murders at the Tate and La Bianca residences were done in such a similar fashion, police first believed they were copycat murders, that they weren't related to each other. Some crazy bunch killed these guys and when it got on the news, somebody said, oh, that was kind of cool, and they went over and killed some other people. They didn't really put the two together. Well, three months of investigation went on with very few leads, and finally the police got a huge break. A young woman by the name of Susan Atkins uh, was serving time in jail for prostitution, and she bragged to her cellmate about these murders, said she was involved in these two high-profile murders. And so that cellmate informed authorities and after further investigation, a man by the name of Charles Manson was questioned and arrested. Um, in addition to Manson, one male and four females for what they considered a hippie compound near Los Angeles were also arrested for the murders. Uh, Manson, Charles Manson, had actually a group of 32 followers that were living at a place called Spawn Ranch, which was a, remember I said people, these people lived in communes and together? Well, he had his own group. And it was a former movie set that was about 25 miles from downtown Los Angeles. And Manson had a group of 32 followers, mainly women, but a few men that lived with him in this commune. Well, Manson was an interesting guy. He spent 17 of his 32 years of life in reform schools and prisons before he went to Haight-Ashbury trying to get a career in music going. Uh, after putting together his family, which were these 32 followers at Spawn Ranch, Ranch uh, basically, they had a life of togetherness, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And the motive for the two murders were very hard to compre comprehend when they were talking to these people. Um, what happened is the night of August 8, 1969, Manson announced to that group of followers, he said, quote, now is the time for Helter Skelter. And Manson had an obsession with that term. And he was, kind of, he was crazy. He believed that the race war between white and black people that we were having, remember the civil rights thing? He thought 
that they were going to have a war and that the United States was finally going to come to an end, and he thought in the end that the black man would win the war. And since they wouldn't be able to govern themselves because they weren't smart enough, for some reason he thought they would look to him to be the leader of the country. This is what was going through this guy's mind. So it was Madsen's plan to personally incite a race war. How would you do that? How would you hurry up the process to have a war between whites and blacks? You'd do something to make people think black people did it. So he was certain that if he committed these hideous crimes, they'd be blamed upon the black community, leading to a tense black-white relationship, which would lead to this particular uh, race war, and the blacks would win that race war, and he would lead the United States. Honestly, that's what the guy was thinking. Okay? So there you see the name Helter Skelter. And actually, if you look at the way I have it on your ID sheet, and the way it's pronounced is spelled wrong. So they actually spelt the term wrong when they put it on there. Well, because of this, Manson directed his followers to carry out the murders of both the Tate and LaBianca murders. Okay? He was only present at the LaBianca murders, where he entered the LaBianca residence and tied up the two victims. The Tate murders, he didn't even go. Okay? But his followers did. We'll get into that. The LaBianca murders, he actually did break into the LaBianca's house and tie up the victims and then let the other people do the business. Here are the people that were part of this Manson family that were involved in these murders. One was Charles Tex Watson. He was 24 years old at the time of the murders. He did 80% of the killings at the two murder sites. Uh, as a teenager, he led his church group. He was a high school honor roll student, excelling in athletics. He attended North Texas State University for three years then transferred to Cal State in Los Angeles. At Cal State, he quickly dropped out and got caught up in the counterculture movement. He eventually met Charles Manson and moved into the Spawn Ranch with Charles Manson. After his arrest and conviction, he became a born-again Christian in prison and an ordained minister. And in prison, he wrote a biography, which I have over there, that says, Will You Die For Me? And he's been married and divorced and having four children in between while he's been in prison. Okay? The next person involved was a guy by the name of Patricia Krenwinkel. She was 21 years old at the time of the murders. She was at both murder sites. She was born in Los Angeles. Her parents divorced when she was 17. After high school graduation, she moved from California to Alabama to live with her mother, attending a Catholic college for one semester. Krenwinkel then moved back to California to live with her stepsister, who was a heroin addict. She met Charles Manson at a house close to her stepsisters and immediately was captivated by him. He manipulated her, took advantage of her low self-esteem, telling her how beautiful she was when really she was not. Uh, she became one of his followers, moved to the Spawn Ranch, and she was eventually arrested in Alabama for the murders and sentenced. So she went back to Alabama after the murders. She is the longest serving female inmate in the state of California as of today. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll tell you that. Okay, Susan Atkins. Okay, Susan Atkins. She was 21 years old at the time of the murder. She was also at both murder sites. She was born in California, the second of three children, born to alcoholic parents. She dropped out of high school to support herself and her mother. Her mother died when she was 15, and her father abandoned the family. She moved by herself to nearby San Francisco and the hate ashbury scene. She met Charles Manson while staying with friends in San Francisco. She moved to Spawn Ranch and gave birth to a son there. She was one of the most trusted members of Manson's inner circle and was involved in a murder previous to the Tate LaBianca killings. She was taken by Manson with two others to get money from a man Manson knew. When this Gary Hinman would not comply with Manson's request for money, Man uh, Manson slashed his face with a sword and left. Okay. Atkins and two other family members beat and killed him. She was the family member who bragged about the killings to her cellmate that led to the arrest. And she was the longest serving female inmate in the state of California, but she died on September 24th, 2009 in prison. Okay, the next member was Leslie Van Houten. She was only 19 at the time of the murders. She participated only in the La Bianca murders. She was born into a middle class family in California, very outgoing and athletic as a youth. Her parents split up when she was 14. She began to experiment with marijuana and LSD in high school. She ran away to Haight-Ashbury in the summer of 68. 
She was told about a man named Charles Manson by a friend and eventually joined the family at Spawn Ranch. After the murder, she was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. She, served, she has served 45 years in prison, has attended 20 parole hearings, the last in 2013. And the final member piece of this puzzle was Linda Kasabian. And Kasabian was 20 years old at the time of the murders. She was born in Maine, moved to Los Angeles in 1968. She met Charles Manson through a female family member, Manson family member, after leaving her husband to move to Spawn Ranch. She was pregnant and the mother of an infant daughter when she joined the Manson family. She was sent to both murder sites, but she never participated in either crime. She stayed out of the Tate residence behind the house during the first night of killing, listening to the screams from the murders. She came face to face with Wojtek Frykowski as he staggered out of the Tate house the lawn where Watson finished killing him. At the La Bianca murders, Manson drove off with Kasabian after breaking into the residence and tying up the couple. Kasabian turned herself in months after the murders and became the lead witness for the prosecution. Her plea bargain and testimony against the killers allowed her to avoid prison. She moved to New Hampshire to live with her mother after the trial, but because of the constant media and public attention, she changed her name and moved back west. She remained in hiding until a documentary film crew found her living in near poverty in a trailer park in 2009. And the documentary they did on her 40 years after the murder was filmed and it's entitled Manson through the words of Linda Kasabian, which I have. It's an incredible video that tells you about this. Okay, so getting to Shana's questions, the results of the Manson family trial were this. On June 15, 1970, the trial of Manson, Van Houten, Atkins, and Krenwinkel began. Charles Tex Watson was tried individually to try to speed up the trial process. Linda Kasabian was set free as a result of her plea bargain with prosecuting attorneys for her testimony. And on January 25, 1971, Manson, Krenwinkel, Atkins, and Van Houten were found guilty of murder. And on May 29, 1971, Manson, Krenwinkel, Atkins, and Van Houten were given the death sentence for the murders. On October 12, 1971, Watson was convicted of murder and later given the death penalty. After the, con after the convictions and sentencing, a new death row facility had to be built in California because prior to this there had never been any females that had been sentenced to die, and so they had no place to house them, so they built a brand new facility for females on death row. She's with yeah. Now, what happened in the assassination of Robert Kennedy and Sirhan Suryan? What happened in 1972? California abolished the death penalty. And when that happened in 1972, all members of the Manson family were resentenced to life in prison, which would allow the possibility of parole. Now, all of these people have been to parole hearings. Watson, Krenwinkel, uh, Van Houten, Manson, all of them. And every year they've been denied. And guess who showed up until her death at every single parole hearing? What? No, who showed up at every one? No, not at any Sharon Tate's mother. Every single parole hearing, she was there until she died, and then her daughter took up the torch. And those people still have parole hearings today, and the daughter will show up every all of all of her life except for Susan Anthony. And they're still in prison today. So if you could ever find the video, and I have it, Manson through the words of Linda Kasabian, you would really this is a bizarre story. The thing that's most bizarre, you, how many people have heard of Charlie Manson? One crazy bastard. I'm telling you, he's out of his mind. Right now, he's about to marry like a 23-year-old girl in prison. He's got to be 75 or 80. But anyway, he carved a swastika in his head and tattooed it in there. After this, he's just a really strange guy. But if you think about it, Charles Manson is serving a life sentence in prison. Did he kill anyone? No. Never killed a soul. He directed people to do it, in which they gave him the the uh, death sentence as well, and then later in life imprisonment. But you think about Charles Manson, and that's what he complains about all the time. He said, he always says in interviews, I never killed anybody. 
and I'm in here for life. He never killed, and he really didn't. But if you are interested, there's books over here you can borrow. There's a book called Helter Skelter. There's a book called No More Tomorrows, which is a, it's about the La Biancas. It was, that was his term for the white race and the black race to fight. Helter Skelter, great song. Yeah, here's, a, here's this book. Here's this book that Ted Swanson wrote. I like the short one. Will You Die For Me? That's his biography. And then Susan Atkins wrote one too. It's called Child of Satan, Child of God. So, anyway, now, one more last thing, and we're done with this. Another Manson follower that wasn't involved in uh, these murders was Squeaky Frome, was her name. Okay? That was her nickname, Squeaky Fro. She attempted and shot a weapon at President Gerald Ford when he was president, she tried to kill him, and she's in prison for life for an attempted assassination of the president. No, but she, is, she continued to follow Manson, and she made an attempted assassination on President Ford and serves a life sentence as well. So, interesting how far that could happen.